Well, uh, welcome back to Cecilia. Um, now that Dido has successfully learnt to operate um, the stop recording button, um, I <laughs> think that she will not be making future appearances on the table. <clears throat> uh, so, part 36b, we continue where we left off. And we, we are in the middle of um, Cecilia trying to work out what in the world is going on with um, young Delvile's behaviour. What do you think is up with him? Why is he avoiding her? Is he having an affair with Henrietta Belfield? Um, does he like Cecilia? Does he not like Cecilia? What's up with him? All therefore that remained was to imitate his example. Be civil and formal shun or interviews that were not public, and decline or discourse but what good breeding occasionally made necessary. By these means their meetings became more rare than ever, and of shorter duration, for if one by any accident was detained, the other retired, till by their mutual diligence they soon only saw each other at dinner, and though neither of them knew the motives or the intentions of the other, the best concerted agreement could not more effectually have separated them. This task to Cecilia was at first extremely painful, but time and constancy of mind would soon lessen its difficulty. She amused herself with walking and reading. She commissioned Mr Monkton to send her a pianoforte of Merlin's. She was fond of fine work, and she found in the conversation of Mrs Delvile a never-failing resource against languor and sadness. Leaving therefore to himself her mysterious son, she wisely resolved to find other employment for her thoughts, and conjectures with which she could not be satisfied, and doubts that might never be explained. Very few families visited at the castle, and fewer still had their visits returned. The arrogance of Mr Delvile had offended all the neighbouring gentry, who could easily be better entertained than by receiving instructions of their own inferiority, which, however readily they might allow, was by no means so pleasant a subject as to recompense them for hearing no other. And if Mr Delvile was shunned through hatred, his lady no less was avoided through fear. High-spirited and fastidious, she was easily wearied and disgusted. She bore neither with frailty nor folly, those two principal ingredients in human nature. She required, to obtain her favour, the union of virtue and abilities with elegance. Which meeting but rarely, she was rarely disposed to be pleased. And disdaining to conceal either contempt or aversion, she inspired in return nothing but dread or resentment making thus by a want of that lenity, which is the milk of human kindness, and the bond of society, enemies the most numerous and illiberal by those very talents which more meekly born would have rendered her not merely admired but adored. In proportion, however, as she was thus at war with the world in general, the chosen few who were honoured with her favour she loved with a zeal all her own. Her heart, liberal, open, and but too daringly sincere, was fervent in affection and enthusiastic in admiration. The friends who were dear to her, she was devoted to serve. She magnified their virtues till she thought them of a higher race of being. She inflamed her generosity with ideas of what she owed to them, till her life seemed too small a sacrifice to be refused for their service. Such was the love which already she felt for Cecilia. Her countenance had struck, her manners had charmed her, her understanding was displayed by the quick intelligence of her eyes, and every action and every notion spoke her mind the seat of elegance. In secret she sometimes regretted that she was not higher born, but that regret always vanished when she saw and conversed with her. Her own youth had been passed in all the severity of affliction. She had been married to Mr Delvile by her relations without any consultation of her heart or her will. Her strong mind disdained useless complaints, yet her discontent, however private, was deep. Ardent in her disposition, and naturally violent in her passions, her feelings were extremely acute, and to curb them by reason and principle had been the chief and hard study of her life. The effort had calmed, though it had not made her happy. To love Mr Delvile, she felt, was impossible. Proud without merit, and imperious without capacity, she saw with bitterness the inferiority of his faculties, and she found in his temper no qualities to endear or attract. Yet she respected his birth and his family, of which her own was a branch, and whatever was her misery from the connection, she steadily behaved towards him with the strictest propriety. Her son, however, when she was blessed with his presence, had a power over her mind that mitigated all her sorrows, and almost lulled even her wishes to sleep. 
She rather idolised than loved him, yet her fondness flowed not from relationship, but from his worth and his character, his talents and his disposition. She saw in him, indeed, all her own virtues and excellences, with the toleration for the imperfection of, of others, to which she was wholly a stranger. Whatever was great or good she expected him to perform. Occasion alone she thought wanting to manifest him the first of human beings. Nor here was Mr. Delvile himself less sanguine in his hopes. His son was not only the first object of his affection, but the chief idol of his pride, and he did not merely cherish but reverence him as his successor, the only support of his ancient name and family, without whose life and health the whole race would be extinct. No pressure, Mortimer. He consulted him in all his affairs, never mentioned him but with distinction, and expected the whole world to bow down before him. Delvile, in his behaviour to his father, imitated the conduct of his mother, who opposed him in nothing when his pleasure was made known, but who forbore to inquire into his opinion except in cases of necessity. Their minds, indeed, were totally dissimilar, and Delvile well knew that if he submitted to his directions, he must demand such respect as the world would refuse with indignation, and scarcely speak to a man whose genealogy was not known to him. But though duty and gratitude were the only ties that bound him to his father, he loved his mother not merely with filial affection, but with the purest esteem and highest reverence. He knew, too, that while without him her existence would be a burden, her tenderness was no effusion of weak partiality, but founded on the strongest assurances of his worth. And however to maternal indulgence its origin might be owing, the rectitude of his own conduct could alone save it from diminution. Such was the house in which Cecilia was now settled and with which she lived almost to the exclusion of the sight of any other, for though she had now been three weeks at the castle, she had only at church seen any family but the Delviles. Nor did anything in the course of that time occur to her but the reception of a melancholy letter from Mrs. Harrell, filled with complaints of her retirement and misery, and another from Mr. Arnott with an account of the funeral, the difficulties he had had to encounter with the creditors, who had even seized the dead body, and the numerous expenses in which he had been involved, by petitions he could not withstand, from the meaner and more clamorous of those whom his late brother-in-law had left unpaid. He concluded with a pathetic prayer for her happiness, and a declaration that his own was lost for ever, since now he was even deprived of her sight. Cecilia wrote an affectionate answer to Mrs. Harrell, promising when fully at liberty that she would fetch her to her own house in Suffolk, but she could only send her compliments to Mr. Arnott though her compassion urged a kinder message, as she feared even a shadow of encouragement to so serious yet hopeless a passion. Well, we've had a little character sketch of the Delviles. Food for thought, surely. And with that, I will leave you for the evening. Good night. <laughs>